Thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity to speak about um, John Broom's book. Uh, I've been a fan of uh, Broom's work for quite some time and always find myself quite sympathetic to the general philosophical directions he takes. Um, and my basic reaction to the book is certainly along the same lines. I find myself in agreement with large stretches of it and I was worried for a little bit about whether I would have anything to say. Um, but of course I'll focus in my talk on the parts that worry me, but even there I hope that the general line does work out in the end. That said, um, I'm actually not going to be able to provide responses to the worries I'm going to raise here, but my hope is that uh, John will show me where I've gotten myself confused, and then I'll be happy to agree with all of the book. Uh, let me also just say a little bit about the, the title. Um, I'm not actually going to quite cover all the things in the title in quite the way the title suggests. I'll touch on it all, of course. Um, and much of what I will say today is, does connect to the wider literature on rule following, but I plan to set things up as more of an imminent critique from within the framework of uh, Broom's book, just to keep the art line of argument simple, um, also to avoid sort of getting sucked into some of the rule following literature. And finally, because I'm guessing some of that might be the foci of uh, Paul Bogosian's talk, and I wanted to, we didn't manage to coordinate beforehand, um, so I'm going to try to stick, on, stick to the things that I think he won't want to talk about as much. Um, and we'll just have to see whether I've succeeded in avoiding muddying the waters for him. So um, you've all seen the praise already, and I'm going to take you through a lot of the detail of, of John Broom's texts uh, on the assumption that Many of you may not have spent quite as much time on it as uh, I have very recently, and probably um, uh, John Broom too hasn't spent as much time on his book as I have recently, so putting these things quotes up it, it may help us. I'm going to do a fairly close textual analysis, but the point, of course, is philosophical. So officially, the aim of the book is to answer what Broom calls the motivation question. How does it happen that when you believe you ought to do something, your belief often causes you to intend to do what you believe you ought to do? According to Broom, the, as he puts it, the easy answer is just to point to something he calls the encratic disposition. Most people are disposed to intend to do what they believe they ought to do. The easy answer is, he claims, too thin because it does not explain how the encratic disposition works. The project of trying to explain the encratic dis how the encratic disposition uh, works apparently breaks into two sub-projects because there are, according to Broom, two different ways in which the encratic disposition works. On the one hand, sometimes it's a matter of automatic causal processes. The other way in which the disposition works is through reasoning, which, as is very important for Broom, and he insists, is something you do. The reasoning process is supposed to be philosophically interesting. The suggestion seems to, be that the, seems to be that the automatic causal process is not of philosophical interest, though it may still be an interesting and difficult question, as he puts it, exactly how such automatic processes work. He makes clear that he's not interested in telling us much about the automatic process. I'll come back to, at the end, the question of whether or not the lines between automatic processes and non-automatic processes um, can do the work that John wants them to do. Now, why is the reasoning process supposed to be philosophically interesting? Here's what he says in the introduction of his book. We have arrived at a more interesting answer to the motivation question. You have an encratic disposition, and this disposition sometimes works through the philosophically interesting process. This process is encratic reasoning, which is something you do. You have the ability to bring yourself through reasoning to intend to do what you believe you ought to do. I hope to justify this answer. This way of setting up the task might strike one as puzzling. Is it really that interesting to be told that by reasoning one can bring oneself to intend to do what one believes one ought to do? How much justification, and perhaps crucially, what kind of justification does this answer need? Here's my central worry, or sort of the frame. Though much of what Broome goes on to say about rationality and reasoning is quite interesting, and I find myself, as I said before, in agreement with it, what would really make the answer interesting is a detailed story of how such reasoning is indeed something I can do. It's the distinctive details of the story that really are what Broom hopes he'll find interesting and what would really turn out to need a detailed justification. Unfortunately, as I'll try to argue, when we get to those details, there isn't quite enough there. Now, one test, but only one that I will use to see if we have indeed been provided with something 
philosophically interesting, is to see if Broom's answer should satisfy his own explicitly about metaphysical motivation, as he puts it. To answer the, metaf uh, uh, the metaphysical motivation to answer the motivational question. What leads some to non-cognitivism is that they find it puzzling that you can be caused to intend some action by the belief you ought to do it. Broom's book is supposed to account for the encratic disposition in a way that is not puzzling. And thus, it is intended to remove one of the grounds for non-cognitivism. I'm not sure exactly, and I'll come to this, which non-cognitivist puzzles Broom has in mind, but I'll consider a fairly standard one and raise the worry that we don't really have an explanation for how the encratic disposition works that would lead a non-cognitivist to be less puzzled. So that's one of the tests I'm going to use as to whether or not we've got enough detail to the explanations we've been given. So I'm going to focus for most of the talk on uh, what Broom calls linking beliefs. Okay, and so let me introduce that. In attempting to say what reasoning is, Broom writes, it is natural to think that if a mental process of yours is to be reasoning, you must endorse it in some way. One way is to have what I call a linking belief. A higher order linking belief links your premise attitudes with your conclusion attitude. On the other hand, a first order linking belief links together the contents of your attitudes rather than the attitudes themselves. Broom argues for two claims regarding linking beliefs. A higher order linking belief is neither necessary nor sufficient for reasoning. And a first order linking belief is a necessary condition for reasoning. He also seems to claim that when you, come to, when you come to believe a conclusion by operating on the premises to derive a conclusion following a rule, then you either consciously believe that the premises imply the conclusion, or your disposition to derive the conclusion from the premises, where deriving it includes actively operating on the premises following a rule and coming to believe the conclusion, can be treated as itself constituting an unconscious implicit belief that our premises imply the conclusion. Therefore, if you reason, you must have a first order linking belief, at least implicitly. OK, so now the question is, what's the content of this linking belief? And Broom has pretty strong views about it. And one of the points of the, paper, of the book is to argue that the content of this linking belief is not higher order and not normative. He says, the content of a first order linking belief is just a conditional proposition that if P, Q, R, and so on, then T, where P, Q, R, and so on are the premises, and T is the conclusion. I think a reasoner needs the concept of if-then, but nothing more sophisticated than that. So the content of the linking belief is, some, is an if-then statement, a conditional statement, about the content of the relevant attitudes that you go from when you engage in reasoning. Okay? So it doesn't, it's not higher order in the sense that it doesn't refer to the attitudes themselves. It's not about the content. Okay. However, the case of practical reasoning raises complexities. Complexities from which, I've been trying to convince Broom about the complexities for a while, complexities which I will argue Broom doesn't learn all the relevant lessons from the complexities. Okay. So consider, as Broom does, an example of how reasoning from a belief and an intention with the same content P can be quite different. An intention to visit Venice and belief that you will visit Venice obviously participate in your reasoning in different ways. For instance, an intention to visit Venice might be a premise attitude in instrumental reasoning that would lead you to intend to buy a ticket to Venice. If that is, as Broom points out, you believe that you will not visit Venice if you do not buy a ticket. But he continues, suppose you merely believe you will visit Venice, as opposed to having the intention. Perhaps you believe that your cultured aunt will eventually persuade you to go there. Your belief could not play the same role in instrumental reasoning as an intention and bring you to intend to buy a ticket. To keep track of this difference, Broom concludes that when you apply a rule in the course of reasoning with an attitude, the rule must take account of the attitude's type as well as its content. This means that the rule must be defined on the attitude's contents and types taken together. So now you should guess where I'm going. There's linking beliefs only relationships between the propositional content. And now we've got rules that, in fact, are these more complicated beasts, particularly when, it in, when we're talking about practical reasoning. In the instrumental reasoning case, then, the rule could be expressed with the following formalism that Broom introduces to us. Okay. And so Broom draws a distinction between normal contents, which are the kind of contents that we normally think of beliefs and intentions as having, and both an intention that P and a belief that P share the same content in that sense, of an, what he calls an unmarked content. 
And now we're introducing the idea of sort of what he calls marked contents. So the thought would be we can keep track of both the unmarked content, normal content, and the attitude directed at that content. Okay, and it's that pair that we have to keep track of and, the, and uh, uh, in, when we specify what the rules of reasoning are. Okay. So from P, intention, and if P, then Q, belief, to, to derive Q, intention. That's the rule for you when you're reasoning. Similarly, for a case of reasoning by modus ponens, the rule would be from Q, belief, and if P, then Q, which is again a belief, to derive Q, which is again a belief. Now. Again, at first glance, one might think that the linking belief in both cases could just be the kind of first-order linking belief Broom mentioned above, namely the belief in the conditional proposition that if P and if P then Q, then Q, okay? Because if you just focus on the unmarked contents, it has the same, it has the same kind of, uh, the same, same conditional can appear to be playing a role in both of these. In other words, the linking belief would just be a belief about implication between unmarked contents, even though the rule followed in the two cases would be different. However, this cannot be the right story. As Broom himself points out, paradigmatic instrumental reason is not available to you if you believe there's a choice among alternative means to your end. So we were talking about just now a sort of more paradigmatic instrumental reason. Now I'm going to talk about something slightly different to hammer home the point that the picture can't be that simple. So when you believe there's a choice among alternative means to your end, in such cases, you do not believe a particular means is implied by the end. Let's take up two such type of cases which he considers. First is one in which the agent believes that some means M is the best means implied by an end. Best means. So it's not the means that's implied. It's the best means implied by the end. The rule Broom's text suggests for this case is the following. And now I'm adding some of the complexities that uh, John was avoiding um, when, he was laying, when he was describing his requirements. Um, from E, your intention to E, and your belief that M is the best means implied by E, and the belief that M is something that's actually up to you as an agent, the rule is to derive the intention to take the means. If this is the rule being followed, then now the question, what is the linking belief? Recall that a first-order linking belief, the kind which Broom does think are necessary for reasoning, links together, according to him, remember, the contents of the attitudes rather than the attitudes themselves. In correct reasoning the best means, the linking belief would then seem to have the following content in this case. If E and M is the best means implied by E and M is up to me, then M. But this would be quite an odd belief to have in general and particularly if it is supposed to capture the idea, as Broom suggests, that the linking belief is a belief that the premises imply the conclusion. Surely there are many cases where we do achieve an end E while believing that the best means is M and that M is up to me, but where we achieve the end not by taking M, but by taking some inferior means. So that conditional just doesn't hold in general and isn't a sensible thing to think. As Broome puts it, these are cases in which you believe you have a real choice. But of course, if you thought that you're taking the best means simply followed from the fact that it was the best means, that it was up to you and that you'll achieve the end, then it's hard to see how you can think of yourself as having a choice of alternative means in the first place. Broome's other example of a choice of alternative means perhaps brings this out even more clearly. He writes, one interesting case is when you believe that there is, when you believe there is nothing to choose between alternative means. You do not believe that a particular means is best, nor that you ought not to take a particular means. Take the burden's ass case, of course, is what he's thinking of, of the two equally choice-worthy bales of hay. According to Broom, rationality requires that, and this is the feature that burden's ass is missing, obviously, that, that, uh, that burden's ass doesn't take up this requirement. According to Broom, rationality requires that either you now intend to go left or you now intend to go right. The ass, after all, is irrational. That's the problem. Broom claims that you can satisfy the requirement by reasoning, though you apparently have a choice about how to reason. In the book at this point, he doesn't use the formalism above to specify what rule I would be following in doing such reasoning. Instead, he says what the reasoning made explicit. In other words, how you might express the reasoning yourself would be like. So here's one version on which you go left. 
I shall survive. Going either left or right is a means implied by my surviving. Going left is no worse a means than going right. Going left is up to me, so I shall go left. For Broom, the following would also be intuitively correct reasoning. I shall survive. Going either left or right is a means implied by my surviving. Going right is no worse a means than going left. Going right is up to me, so I shall go right. Now, Broom doesn't exactly state what the rule being followed is in either of these cases, but it must be something like the following. Okay, and then two versions of this rule for the two cases. From the intention to E, if E, then the belief that if E, then either L or R, L is no worse a means than R, L and R is left and right, obviously. Belief that L is up to me, so I derive to derive the intention to go left. Now, of course, we get an even weirder content for a, a flat-footed linking belief, where we only look, focus on the unmarked contents. In this case, the linking belief would seem to have the following content. And I won't even bother trying to read it all out. Again, if you think about it, an odd, odd belief to have, and surely an odd belief to have for what is a fairly standard bit of reasoning. Now, the obvious thought to have is that the linking belief needs to contain the information about the attitudes directed at the contents. Or in other words, the problem is the linking belief as I've been conceiving it, following Broom, is a belief only about an implication between unmarked contents. Okay, so that seems to be the diagnosis of the problem. Now, I have to say that when it comes to interpreting Broom, I'm a little bit perplexed, and hopefully John will help us here, because um, uh, in one of his other papers, and in the comment on Paul Bogosian's piece on what is inference, Broom actually seems to notice this point that I'm making, though I don't think it reappears in the books. So I'm a little bit confused. In the comment on, the, on Bogosian's paper, um, he says, Broom explicitly argues that Bogosian's taking condition, which very crudely speaking is Bogosian's equivalent of uh, Broom's linking belief, that the taking condition cannot in general just be a matter of the relation of support between contents of attitudes, because that wouldn't work for the case of instrumental reasoning. And this is now Broom himself. In the case of instrumental reasoning, a corresponding condition would be that you take the content of your premise intention, which is the proposition that you achieve the end, to support the content of your conclusion intention, which is the proposition you take the means. But what makes you do reasoning is plainly not your taking there to be a support relation between these propositions. More plausibly, you may take the premise intention itself, the attitude rather than its content, to support the conclusion intention itself, which seems to be exactly the kind of point I'm trying to hammer home. So I've labored the point a bit about how the, uh, the content, the linking belief can't just be between the contents, unmarked contents of the attitudes, because in the book, that seems to be a position he sticks to all the time, even though that doesn't quite fit with the comment here in the article on uh, Bogosian. So hopefully John will clear this up. Interpretive puzzle. Let us return then to the question of what then the content of the linking belief should be, if we're going to amend John's view. As we've seen, Broom introduces the notion of marked contents, those pairs that you saw. And as we saw in a specification of the relevant rules of reasoning, these play a crucial ro role in stating the rules of reasoning. However, it's not obvious, and so you might think marked contents is the way to go. <laughs> However, it's not obvious how bringing in marked contents will help with the matter of the content of the linking belief. If we simply try to add the marked content, the content of the linking belief would then be something like this. And as Broom himself says about this kind of thing, it seems to be nonsense. Okay. Um, his apparent reasons, though, this for this are somewhat intriguing. Regarding his rules of reasoning, he just declares the words from, and, and to derive all belong to the meta language in which the rule is described. They cannot be absorbed into the object language. For instance, the object language contains no sentence such as if A, A type, B, B type, and C, C type, then K, K type. That is nonsense. Okay. Now, what's interesting, though, is, um, uh, is that he immediately, when he adds the, when he shifts from using the mark contents in the rule to the, to trying to describe what the content of the linking belief is, he immediately assumes it's a conditional notice. Right? That's the option he considers. Right. So, as we saw Broom himself grants, when you apply a rule in the course of reasoning with an attitude, the rule must take account of the attitude's type as well as its content. Okay, so, um, now recall that the point of a linking belief is to capture the idea 
that if you reason, you must think of your conclusion as arising somehow from your premises. So you must have a belief, as Bruhn puts it, that links the premises and conclusion. That's the basic thought, remember, that I'm now going back to see whether we can save the idea of a linking belief by, by modifying the content. But the point about taking the account of the attitude type as well as this content would lead, one would think, to the thought that in reasoning you must think of your conclusion, understood now as a combination of both content and attitude type, as arising, again to use that language, from your premises also understood now as a combination of both content and attitude type. And the crucial upshot of realizing that part of what you have to be thinking of when you think of your conclusion as arriving from your premises is that the relevant link in the linking belief, and therefore the content of the awareness of that link, cannot be simply implication, since implication is a link that holds only between traditional truth conditional unmarked contents. So. If we do replace if and then with from and to derive, again in a very flat-footed way, you say from this, content of belief, from this, derive that. You still wouldn't, of course, get something that makes sense as a content of a belief, because what you have is something that looks like an imperative. Okay. So I'm going to consider some other options. Uh, and I'm going to start with a natural one and then consider some other ones. And my worry, of course, is that these various options all create various kinds of problems for Broom's overall project in his book, okay? which is why I'm sure he was avoiding them in the first place. But I'm going to go through them and, and, and show you how difficult it gets. So here's one natural thought to have. Namely, to take the content of the relevant linking belief as normative, or at least to use the from and derive language without shifting to a conditional. From A, A type and B, B type and C, C type, and et cetera, et cetera, one is rationally permitted to derive K, K type. Now, remember when Broom was talking about rational permissions and requirements and following rules, there is a gap. But a permission isn't going to be enough. The rule is something more than a, that you follow has to be more than something than just having the permission. You've got lots of permissions around, and you can have lots of beliefs about permissions. So when you shift the way the linking belief is going to play a role in getting you to reason, is going to involve an additional complexity where you go from a permission like this to the rule that corresponds with it. The question is, what does the agent, what attitude does the agent have to have to the link between the premises and the conclusion? Okay, and the suggestion is the agent needs to conceive of those as there being a permission to go from one to the other. Okay, even though having that permission, being aware of the permission, isn't yet the full story of what it is to be following the relevant rule. Can't be, because it's just a permission. OK, so it is true that one has to actually do something more than have this belief. One has to choose to carry out the action. One is permitted to carry out. Carrying out the action will be a matter, presumably, of following the rule that one's linking belief permits one, in some sense, to follow. Broom objects in his book to higher order linking beliefs like this on two grounds. One worry is that this sort of belief has a sophisticated content that involves concepts such as rationality, requirement, permit, ought, and belief. You do not need to have such sophisticated concepts in order to reason. A child could reason before she learns about rationality or about beliefs. And given my proposal of the linking belief, we'd have to add derive and intention to the list of sophisticated concepts. Okay. And so that probably presumably only makes the problem worse. So is the option immediately hopeless? Well, what's interesting is that when Broom lays out his arguments in favor of a linking belief, he has a footnote to Audi's book, Structure of Justification, and says that the kind of view that Audi is giving there is something that's very similar to his view. And Audi has a suggestion that I don't think Broom takes up in his book. I'm slightly worried that I'm missing something. Again, Broom can remind me. Audi suggests that the linking belief could be a de re belief that does not require any particular conceptualization of the relation between premises and conclusion, or presumably between premise attitudes and conclusion attitudes, and presumably also any doesn't require any particular conceptualization of the attitudes directed at the premises and the conclusion. Now, I'm not going to try to figure out whether de re beliefs are, in this case are something that is going to make sense, but that's one option to consider to try to deal with this problem. Um, and we can come back to it, but it would take me way too far afield to try to deal with it now. Nonetheless, if you could make that idea work, as Audi certainly hopes and tries to use this idea for solving exactly this kind of problem, 
namely requiring too much sophistication on the part of reasoners. It would help you deal with the worry of ordinary people needing sophisticated concepts in order to reason. So I'm just going to stop on that particular branch of the tree. That's as far as I'm going to go. Okay. Broom has another objection, though, to higher order linking beliefs. Broom is worried that the linking, and I'm going to long quote, sorry, um, the linking belief might have nothing to do with any relation of implication that holds between the premises and the conclusion. Okay. So now think of it. So this is put in terms of his notion of implication, but the example given can apply to any kind of higher order view, even if we replace the conditional with my language of being permitted to derive. Here is an example. Suppose that you believe it is raining and that if it is raining, the snow will melt. Suppose these beliefs cause you to believe you hear trumpets. Suppose next that you believe rationality requires you to believe you hear trumpets if you believe it is raining, and if it is raining, the snow will melt. That is to say, you have a higher order linking belief, though obviously an odd one. Suppose, however, that you do not have this belief because you believe that the propositions that it is raining and that if it is raining, the snow will melt implies the proposition that you hear trumpets. Instead, your linking belief arises from some weird theory of rationality that you hold. For instance, suppose you believe that rationality requires you to have patterns of belief that are good for you. And you believe it is good for you to believe you hear trumpets when you believe it is raining and that if it is raining, the snow will melt. Obviously, a lot more of the story needs to be filled out. But uh, in this example, the bizarre process you go through is not reasoning, Broom says. The presence of your weirdly grounded linking belief is not sufficient to make it so. Now, I've already argued, or tried to argue, that given that we are also giving an account of practical reasoning, we cannot just restrict ourselves to implication between premises and conclusions understood as unmarked content. That's off the table. But Broom's example may still raise a worry that we need to place some restrictions on the kind of connection posited by the linking belief. Recall the content scheme I suggested for the higher order linking belief. One approach would be to place an emphasis on the word derive. After all, one could think that in the above example as described, one does not think that one is permitted to derive the belief that one hears trumpets. Derive, that is, as opposed to say, just come to have. I admit I worry a little bit about circularity here. With emphasis placed on derive in that manner, it is hard not to hear rationally permitted to derive as basically equivalent to rationally permitted to engage in reasoning that leads to. <laughs> Our account of reasoning now seems to have as a necessary condition having a belief essentially about what kind of reasoning one is allowed to do. Now, again, how troubling this objection will be depends a lot on which kinds of processes you find bizarre here. You may not even be moved by John Broome's example in the first place, right? As one to ponder a little bit. Um, uh, but in any case, I'm again going to go on because I worry actually that there are even more serious circularity problems lurking here. Once we turn to the explanatory role the linking belief must play in the reasoning process. All right. Broom considers a case of arriving at a conclusion belief in which you have the linking belief, but it plays no causal role in the process. In such a case, he declares, the mere existence of the linking belief is not enough to make the process reasoning. He then writes, the need for the linking belief to have a causal role creates a problem. I describe the process of reasoning as one where some attitudes of yours cause a new attitude. I have just said that your conclusion belief is caused by your premise belief together with your linking beliefs. So your linking belief is among the attitudes that cause a new attitude. This apparently makes it a premise belief in the reasoning. Okay, so his worry is that the linking belief will become a premise belief. Now, my my reasons for pointing to this is not to actually focus on this particular puzzle. Okay? My point is just to give you textual evidence that the causal role is something that Broom buys. And if that's not good enough for you, then I can give you arguments why he has to buy the causal role. So he takes the resulting problem seriously and then points forward in the text to a solution. And I won't probably have time to talk about the solution. But I'll take all this to suggest that Broom does think that it is a necessary condition on the linking belief playing the relevant necessary role in making a mental process reasoning that it also play a causal role in that process. 
Given the essential role that the linking belief plays in embodying the endorsement of the agent, what makes reasoning something the agent does, this of course makes sense. After all, we want the agent's endorsement to play a role in the process of coming to have the conclusion attitude in order for that process to count as an activity of the agent. Our linking belief, then, has to play a causal role in explaining how I come to acquire the conclusion attitude. And in the option we're currently considering, the linking belief apparently has to have both higher order and normative content. These features of the linking belief are needed in order to explain how reasoning works. And having an account of how reasoning works, remember, is supposed to help us see how the encratic disposition works in the philosophically interesting cases. Okay, so remember, we're linking belief is needed in order to show that you're reasoning. That's in order to show how the encratic disposition works in the interesting cases. Um, this, in turn, is supposed to answer the motivation question. How does it happen that, quote, when you believe you ought to do something, your belief often causes you to intend to do what you believe you ought to do? Okay, so we're introducing the linking belief. It has to play a certain kind of explanatory role in reasoning. Reasoning plays an explanatory role in how the encratic disposition works. That, in turn, is supposed to explain to you, give a philosophically interesting explanation to answer the motivation question. There is a more general motivation question, however, namely how do normative beliefs in general, and not just the belief that I ought to do something, play a role in reasoning to intentions? Now, if you, if you, if you grant that there's a puzzle there about normative beliefs in general, then I worry that we have arrived at another problematic circle. The philosophically interesting explanation of how the normative belief that I ought to do something causes me to intend to do it involves appealing to the explanatory role of another normative belief, namely the normative belief that I'm permitted to derive the intention. And that explanatory role is also part of the explanation of the process of my coming to have the relevant intention. Now, of course, one could just refuse to say anything more about how the second normative belief plays this causal role, but then the philosophically interesting explanation seems to bottom out on a non-philosophically interesting explanation of a pretty similar question. How satisfied one should be with that response is, again, not immediately clear to me. But I, I want to say that perhaps Broom shouldn't be satisfied with the response, given his own metaphysical motivation, remember, about non-cognivism for the arguments of the book. Recall that he thinks that by accounting for the encratic disposition in a way that is not puzzling, he will undermine the motivations of those non-cognitivists who do find it puzzling that you can be caused to intend some action by the belief that you ought to do it. Unfortunately, at this point in the book, he gives only one example of such a non-cognitivist, namely Alan Gibbard. And somebody was joking about this earlier today, you know, Gibbard interpretation, I sort of, that's a tricky business. I don't want to wade into that too much here. So I'm just going to help get a start on this question about whether or not we've got a good enough explanation to satisfy the non cognitivist by considering a, a fairly straightforward kind of traditional argument for non cognitivism namely one that turns on traditional internalist positions. So imagine that one did accept as a starting point some form of judgment internalism, the view that there is a conceptual or internal link between making a normative judgment and being motivated to act as the judgment prescribes. The puzzle is a puzzle about how the normative content of a belief state could necessitate the relevant motivation when contents of beliefs don't normally need to generate that particular kind of motivation. So let me be clear about this. A functionist about beliefs who sees them as essentially causal dispositional states might well grant that for an agent to have the belief that A is F, the agent must, as a matter of conceptual necessity, be disposed to lose the belief on coming to believe that nothing is F, disposed to acquire the belief I coming to uh, I believe that something is F, et cetera, et cetera. But nothing in the normal functional specification of beliefs for any non-normative or non-evaluative form of content requires the relevant motivation, the relevant disposition to acquire an intention, or so one might argue. And this, as is usually emphasized in such stories, is not surprising if the role of a belief is to keep track of how certain facts are in the world. Okay. So that's usually where the direction of fit story uh, uh, is brought in in some form or the other. And again, I'm just trying to give you a rough sketch of, of this terrain. What is puzzling then for this non-cognitivist is that believing in a particular kind of fact 
would suddenly change this feature of beliefs. For a particular kind of F, a belief that A is F would of necessity involve having a disposition to acquire the intention to A. Why would attempting to keep track of this particular kind of fact or having a belief with this particular kind of content require the belief to play this particular kind of additional functional role? Okay. And then we can add on to that modal separability arguments, the kind of thing that Michael Smith runs. Um, but somewhere around there is one traditional puzzle or sets of puzzles about um, how um, beliefs can motivate, normative beliefs can motivate. So that's the kind of thing that's puzzling about the encratic disposition, or at least to the kind of non cognitivist including, I think, Gibbard, that comes to mind when I think of the person that Broom wants to respond when he's moved by his metaphysical motivation. So now I return to Broom's reported explanation. The philosophically interesting, less puzzling explanation of how the encratic disposition works turns out to appeal to the explanatory role of another normative belief in bringing about an attention. No non-cognivist that I know would deny that a belief could just cause some intention. What they're concerned with is something more along the lines of whether when the state is functioning as it's supposed to, one reading of the idea of a conceptual internal link, it could play the required role in bringing about the relevant intention. Broom's account of reasoning seems to assume that it can because the account of how the encratic disp disposition works assumes, at least on the option we've been considering so far, that our normative linking belief plays a causal role in bringing about the relevant intention. OK. Now, recall when I first raised the issue of the content of linking beliefs for practical reasoning, I said there might be some other options than just the initial flat-footed option of making it a higher order, normative, but straightforward belief. So Broom himself suggests the option of not having the linking belief consciously. So one question is what it, that would help. So he writes, we cannot require you to endorse the rule explicitly since you may not explicitly know the rule you are applying. So the rule, whatever is the way you're keeping track of it, we can't require he's claiming that it's a conscious thing. And when you apply a rule in reasoning, you automatically give it a sort of endorsement. No further endorsement is needed. You automatically endorse the rule by coming to have the attitude it takes you to. In belief reasoning, you come to believe the conclusion. True, believing the conclusion is not by itself enough of an endorsement to make a process reasoning. So he gives a bizarre example earlier on in which you just have a sequence of thoughts where the trumpet comes at the end. Um, not because you have a linking belief that's weird, but just a sequence of thoughts. In the bizarre examples I first imagined it, you ended up believing you hear trumpets. But in that example, you do not endorse any rule because you do not follow a rule. The belief just comes to you. Two beliefs and then the trumpet belief pops up. When you arrive at your conclusion by operating on the premises to derive a conclusion, I have a noxious version of the same slide where all, a lot of these action verbs are all sort of in bold. Okay? Um, when you arrive at your conclusion by operating on the premises to derive a conclusion following a rule, then believing the conclusion is a sufficient endorsement of the rule. In this case, we may say you believe that the premises imply the conclusion. You will not believe the conclusion if you did not believe the premises imply it. You may not believe this consciously. If you do not, we may treat your disposition to derive the conclusion from the premises, where deriving it includes actively operating on, again notice, where deriving it includes actively operating on the premises following a rule and coming to believe the conclusion as itself constituting an unconscious implicit belief that the premises imply the conclusion. So, one might try to read this as suggesting that all one really needs in order to be reasoning is the disposition to acquire the conclusion attitude when one has the premise attitude. Such a disposition, that would be wonderful, such a disposition would not need to involve perhaps any conceptualization at all, let alone concepts that are too difficult for children. Since it isn't a full-blown belief, it won't be something that could follow in any straightforward sense from a weird theory of rationality, so we don't have that worry. And it doesn't involve a normative belief whose deployment as part of an explanation might beg the question against a certain kind of non-cognitivist. Now, obviously, things aren't so simple. Broom grants, I take it, in his earlier exchanges with Boghossian and implicitly in the book, that the above simple picture of a just a straightforward disposition wouldn't do since it is far too passive. 
It is quite unclear that there is any endorsement by the agent of the process playing a role, and so quite unclear that it is an activity of the agents in any interesting sense. Now I'm just focusing on taking that, this long passage and pulling out something really simple from it. Okay, Just this idea of a causal disposition linking the premises states with the conclusion state. As Broom puts it, reasoning is something you do. It is not merely a causal process that takes place in your mind. To be sure, it is a causal process that takes place in your mind. When you reason, your premise attitudes cause your conclusion attitudes. But reasoning is not merely a causal process. Somehow you do it. How exactly is it something you do? After granting the difficulty of this question, in particular by pointing to Bogosian's work on the matter, Broom attempts to answer this question by introducing the attitude of a mental process seeming right to an agent. Okay, So certain kinds of mental processes seem right to you and others don't. And requiring that in addition one have a disposition to correct, that's the term he uses, to correct. You have a counterfactual disposition to change your attitude if the process that seemed right, if the process seeming right, if you were to check and if the checking produced a different result. Okay, so the suggestion is one of the things we're going to add to a simple disposition is this sense that certain pro that the process actually seems right to you. Okay, that's one way in getting the agent involved, right? Potentially. The other is this idea of correction. The thought that it's not just in any old disposition, it's a complex disposition because when it goes off track, there's, a, there's something called correction that happens. Okay, this is part of Broom's attempts to deal with rule-following worries. Okay, though again, I'm going to stick mostly just to the way Broom sets it up. Broom emphasizes that seeming right need not involve a particular kind of phenomenology. It is seeming right that distinguishes, as he puts it, following a rule from mere causation. Now, I admit, and I'm going to let presumably let uh, Professor Bogosian go on about this more, unfortunately I find it a bit hard to understand quite what Broom is getting at in this solution. Read flat-footedly, talk of seeming right seems to introduce normative content right in the heart of the account. What really is the difference between thinking that the process of transitioning from such and such mental states to such and such mental, other mental states seems right to you and having something like the higher order linking belief I proposed? Indeed, at this point it isn't clear whether these suggestions are compatible in fact, with the idea of an unconscious implicit linking belief. Recall that last part of the earlier quotation. You would not believe the conclusion, so starting right near the bottom, you would not believe the conclusion if you did not believe the premises imply it. You may not believe this consciously. If you do not, we may treat your disposition to derive the conclusion from the premises, where deriving it includes actively operating on the premises, following a rule, and coming to believe the conclusion as itself constituting an unconscious implicit belief. However, now we realize that actively operating on the premises, following a rule, requires that the process seem right to you. Okay. Can something unconsciously seem right to you? Perhaps the thought is that the disposition to correction is what really matters, and that seeming right is just a matter of that disposition not having been triggered. That doesn't seem sufficient for the kind of endorsement needed to make reasoning an activity of mind, I think. So consider, consider, consider the example of conversational distance, um, supposedly. Uh, and I've seen this. <laughs> Individuals raised in different cultures attempt to maintain different distances from others when engaged in conversation. Once watched a German and American slowly move across a room uh, because Americans want a certain distance, but Germans want less distance. So the result is they'll slowly sort of continuously adjust. German will get close to the American. And suppose it's even worse with Saudis, because Saudis supposedly on a global scale have one of the closest conversational distance norms. So um, in one sense, in a, such a conversation, they keep assessing the distance and correcting the distance from each other. That's one way you could put it. And I'm happy to grant that there's some sense in which maintaining the right distance is something I do, but it's hard to see this sense of doing as sufficient for the active reasoning Broom seems to be trying to account for in his book. Another example that Broom uses is um, grammar rules. Okay. And those are also an interesting case because there are two kinds of rules. 
there is the kind of rule that a, syn a, a, a sophisticated syntactician finds, some rule of how it is that I'm putting things together. And it's true that I follow those rules, and it's a complicated business. Um, is that conscious enough? Is that? And then there's another version where, you know, when I'm trying to not make some mistake, I actively follow a rule. Um, <clears throat> But as, the, but as many a broom quotation would suggest, the dispositions involved include actively operating on the contents and applying a rule. Surely that isn't what's happening in the conversational distance case. I'm happy to grant that precisely what is at issue here is what it means to actively operate and to apply rules. Appealing to dispositions then doesn't, as far as I can see, help us deal with the problems generated by having a higher order normative linking belief, at least with the problems I focused on. And I suspect it also doesn't help with more standard worries about rule following, but I'm going to leave that to others to discuss. And since I have a little bit more time, I just want to add one last bit. So let me just um, One of the things that Broom wants to do is to make sure that the kind of account that he gives is compatible with um, forms of normative realism, OK? So it's not, it's not supposed to be ruling those out. And in fact, he partly sets, it, sets itself up so that, in fact, it might support by taking non-cognitivism out. Um, but of course, that's kind of an interesting move to make, because if, one, if, if we articulate normative realism, this isn't a view that Broom tries to defend, but as a form of uh, non-derivative normativity, right? So the rational requirements just are at a basic level the normative requirements, then there will just be these facts about what's rationally required. Okay? Now, you want a successful reasoner, one whom we respect for their reasoning abilities, to be actually keeping track of these normative facts. So think of the analogy of the moral case. Okay? A moral agent, you want the moral agent who does the right thing to do it in part because they're keeping track of what the right thing is. Okay, they're keeping track, if you have a realist picture, of what the facts about rightness out there are. Okay? So that gives you another reason for thinking that there's got to be something like, if you're leaving space for a certain kind of normative realism, and if you're also leaving space for the idea that the requirements of rationality could be foundational normative facts, that your account has to, be, has to allow for a state, some kind of attitude, playing a central role in reasoning that's in the business of keeping track of this part of normative reality. Okay? So that's another kind of consideration to, to, uh, for why you need something like a normative linking belief. Okay, thank you. <laughs>